Hello, welcome back to BioClass Bytes. In this video, we are going to talk about population dynamics. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. In this video, we are going to talk about the following topics, biotic potential and environmental resistance. To have an overview um, for this particular uh, lesson, I recommend that you watch this video entitled Population's Biotic Potential. I'll provide the link in the description below. So, biotic potential and environmental resistance are two major forces that help maintain balance in an ecosystem. So, we define biotic potential as the population's capacity for growth, usually represented by R max wherein R refers to the intrinsic rate of increase or uh, the rate of population growth with unlimited resources. Okay? So assuming that there is unlimited food, water, enough space, um, um, uh, good temperature or conducive temperature, everything that an organism would need um, or a, a community would need, um, what is there? rate of reproduction how fast will they be uh, will they uh, how fast will they reproduce so that's biotic potential okay so our max um what's the capacity how how big can that population grow um with unlimited resources okay so biotic potential is the maximum growth rate okay we've talked about that um it depends on a number it, it depends on the following you know, the number of offspring um, their, their average survival rate, for example, um, how many of the offspring will survive, how early and how often reproduction takes place. Okay? Now, please note that uh, biotic potential is hard to measure outside, uh, hard to measure outside the lab. Okay? So, it's, it's hard to actually set the parameters in order to study this in the actual environmental setup. So, most of the time, um, scientists try to simulate uh, biotic potential in the laboratory or they actually go and observe organisms in the wild but of course they have to include all the limitations of their study. Now one important thing that's connected to biotic potential are the different reproductive strategies that animals, uh, that plants and animals and organisms have in order to increase the possibility and the probability of their offspring to survive into adulthood. And we will talk more about um, reproductive strategies as we go along. Okay, so again, reproductive strategies, they ensure that births okay, will exceed deaths. Okay, so it, it ensures that there's, there will be a high survival rate of the offspring. Um, so that's just an overview. Now, environmental resistance is the other force that maintains balance that maintains balance in an ecosystem so environmental resistance are factors that limit the population so these counter counters biotic potential so biotic potential increase increase in population environmental resistance it limits the population growth okay so these are called limiting factors okay they and they are determined by the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. So, how many population? How how big of a population? For example, how many how many lions can can this um, uh, ecosystem sustain? Right, wherein all of them will survive. So that's carrying capacity. How many leopards? How many? For example, how many frogs? How many snakes? How, what's the population of a species that, that this ecosystem can sustain? So that's carrying capacity. So um, as what I've mentioned, no, all of these um, concepts are quite hard to, to, um, to, to specify and to determine in the wild because there's a lot of factors to consider. So however, um, environmentalists, ecologists, biologists, scientists are still learning more and more about these factors that shape the ecosystem. Right? So... Um, so, uh, biotic potential assumes that there's unlimited resources, but that's not the case. No population can grow indefinitely or unlimited because there's always limitations in resources, okay? There's no such thing as unlimited resor resources. There's always limitations or limited resources. So, organisms will compete for light, water, nutrients, uh, food, um, uh, they will also compete with each other for the right to mate with their female and the territories and so on and so forth. So, 
So, I uh, mentioned reproductive strategies, okay? So, there are two major reproductive strategies that organisms employ in order to raise the chances of their offspring to survive, okay? So, these are, the first one, R selection, okay? So, the clue there is R, so that refers to biotic potential, that refers to unlimited growth, with as assuming that there's unlimited resources. So, in R selection reproductive strategy, what organisms do is that they have masses of offspring in one reproductive uh, shot or one reproductive um, activity, okay? one laying of egg, one, one reproductive season, one breeding season, one mating. Okay? So they have lots and lots of offspring. For example, these are, these are usually done by um, most fish, most amphibians. Okay? So they release thousands of eggs and thousands of sperms into the water and then hope, hoping that um, among thousands, hundreds will, will be fertilized and then out of hundreds, for example, 50 of them or, or 80 of them will reach adulthood. Okay? So this works well in uncrowded environment, I've just mentioned, in seas, in open water, where population may expand rapidly. Okay? A hazardous environment where few will survive, okay, such as in you know, open ocean where in there's a lot of predators that could eat the eggs or could eat the baby fish, the growing fish, or a rapidly changing environment where swift swift adaptation is needed. Okay, so our selection goes by numbers. Okay, it produces many offspring, but uh, the parents will not usually do not take care of the offspring. So, in order to increase the, the survival of, of their offspring, they just have many children, okay? many, many offspring. Okay? So, that, for example, if half of it are eaten by a predator, then you, they still have the remaining half who will, who will hopefully reach into adulthood. Okay? We'll, we'll talk more about our selection as we go along. The other reproductive strategy is K selection. So, K here can actually be taken from carrying capacity. Okay? So, we'll talk more about this K in carrying capacity. So here, um, this is the other type of reproductive strategy wherein the parents have few offspring. So it's the other way around. Few offspring, but they care for their young. They take care of their offspring. So they will only just have one or two, but they take care of the offspring until such time that the, uh, that, that offspring will grow into adulthood and can fend for itself, okay? can feed itself, and then can fight off predators by itself so because of this similar to to our selection the goal is to increase the survival of the rate of survival of the offspring so in case selection uh, since the parents are the ones taking care of their young uh, during during uh, infancy this is actually uh, this actually ensures that the the offspring will reach adulthood okay um, this strategy often works in when population is near the environment's carrying capacity when there's many already, there's many of them already in the um, ecosystem. Okay, when when they have reached the carrying capacity, for example, of gibbons in the ecosystem, then usually this is what organisms would would perform a okay, case selection. Okay, so uh, however, it can be risky if the population drops too far. This is quite uh this reproductive strategy is quite a slow way to build. The population back up okay so that's why uh, most of the organisms who perform case selection such as your reptiles and your birds and your mammals okay um, a lot of them have um, it's quite easy for them to be placed under the endangered species list because uh, they perform case selections and if there's a, a, a decrease in their number since this is how they reproduce their reproductive strategy, it's quite difficult for them to actually increase the number of their population. Population. So, for example, orangutans, they only have one offspring every five years. Okay? One in every five years. Okay? Elephants, they, their, their pregnancy uh, period can last for two years. So, they cannot have an offspring for two years because the mother elephant is pregnant. In humans, we only have nine months of pregnancy. So these are all of those limitations of uh, case selection, uh, reproductive strategies. However, as early as now, I want to emphasize, there's no, there's, um, these two are eff effective um, based on the organisms that perform them. Right? So for fish and amphibians and some other organisms, for plants, our selection, 
um, is effective for them. Okay? It ensures that that's why they're still here. If this does not work, then it would have been wiped out through our evolutionary journey. Um, and then nobody will be doing it anymore. But the fact that we still have organisms doing our selection, it means that for their species, for their group of organisms, our selection works for them. While other organisms, case selection works for them because, again, both of them only aims to ensure the survival of their offspring. So, so there's no comparison that oh, our selection is better than case selection. It depends on the species. So whenever we talk about population dynamics, we also have to be familiar with the different factors that affect uh, that affect it, okay? Such as the de population density, population dispersion, and age structure of the population. So let's look at them one by one. So the first one is population density. This refers to the number of individuals of a population that live or inhabit a particular region or land or water area, okay? So, how many people are there in that area? Okay? What's their population? Uh, so, this is a, wor a world map showing us the population density of humans as of 2019. So, the uh, those countries with uh, below 50 humans per square mile are the following, okay? So, there's very few people given in given a square mile. So countries like Australia, you have Russia here, Mongolia, some parts of Africa here, uh, Greenland, Canada, um, Argentina, Bolivia, if I'm not mistaken, and is this Parag uh, Uruguay? Paraguay, I, I, I have forgotten. So these countries, the, uh, New Zealand, these countries have few people per square mile, per square mile okay? so there's only 50 per square mile. The next would be 50 to 100 and then 100 to 250 people or humans per square mile. So that's the following country. So you have United States, Alaska, Brazil, some some countries here in Africa. I, I'm not familiar. Um, so, okay. so some parts of Europe also here, they have very few people per square mile. But uh, this color light blue 200 to 500 people per square mile so that's um, China here um, Indonesia Malaysia what else um, again some parts of uh, Europe I'm not I'm not sure I think uh, um, no this is Italy okay, so some parts of Europe perhaps Sweden Denmark and all that then this is where the Philippines um, falls okay 500 to 1000 people per square mile okay so the philippines is one of that uh, we have this much number of people in our given um land okay so that's quite too many people in a very small area so philippines have that um japan south Co south korea vietnam um pakistan i think nepal yeah this is germany italy united kingdom uh, and others. Okay. I think this is Puerto Rico. And then, um, color violet, 1,000 to 5,000 humans per square mile. So you have here very prominent India. And then, um, is this Taiwan? I, I think this is Taiwan. Or, or uh, This is North Korea, then this is South Korea, color violet, South Korea, and then this is Taiwan, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And then we cannot see it here, but there are some parts of the globe where they have 5,000 to 10,000 people per square mile and then 10,000 and above per square mile. So it shows us, this map shows us how dense each country is. Okay, In the Philippines, we are halfway there. We have, so, we have many people or many humans given our small, popul uh, small region, okay? small area, small, small land, okay? while the others... They have um, quite a big area to support their population. So this map is from our world in data. It shows us the distribution of the world population over the last 5,000 years. So 3,000 BC, 3,000 years BC. Okay, so as you can see, um, uh, the, uh, the world is not that much populated. Okay, so most of the uh, humans are found here, um, some are here in China, Mongolia, India, in some parts. But, uh, but as time goes by, 
more and more people are being born and um, the lifespan um, uh, increases and then the child mortality rate uh, decreases and then we have sanitation and medicine and hospitals to support those who are sick so the lifespan of a few months becomes longer and longer and then more and more people are being born uh, because of food production so there's you see this trend that from 6 to 10 um, 6 to 10 humans per square kilometer then as you can see they are increasing in number okay so more and more people are found in this area and then this is um the the current uh, distribution of world population okay so most of the dense regions as you can see there's the philippines you also have here very dense india um, china japan and other parts of the globe okay you can actually check this out in, at uh, our world in data here so you can check out the world population growth from our world in date our our world in data so i'll provide the link in the description below So this is another uh, map from our world in data that shows us population density as of 2017. The other one was as of 2019 and it was measured by um, population per square mile. But this one is uh, population uh, in square kilometers. Okay, So actually same thing, 600 to 800 are the most uh, humans per square kilometer are, are the most densely populated uh, region. So you have here some parts of India. Okay. The Philippines is somewhere here, 400 to 600, Japan, South Korea, okay, so some parts also of Europe, very densely populated regions of the world. So the next uh, concept is population dispersion. This tells us how individuals of a population are spaced, how are they distributed within a region, okay? So let's see here. So these are the three major types of uh, population dispersion so again it shows us the spatial relationship between members of a population within a habitat so we have clumping dispersion so here the organisms the population tend to flock together okay so this is the most common pattern of population they flock together uniform distribution or uh, dispersion they are uniformly spaced out or uniformly distributed throughout the there's an equal number of uh, space between each individual um, they are equally spaced all throughout the region and then random dispersion they do not follow um, any any pattern they are they just they just grow wherever it is possible or they just um, they just settle on areas wherein it's possible for them to survive so let's look at examples okay so here uniform pattern okay um, uh, for example, territorial birds such as penguin, they tend to have a uniform distribution. They tend to um, uh, keep a safe distance from each other so that they will have this area for them to feed. Okay, so same with um, other other arboreal uh, birds or or birds that live on, on top of trees. They they build their nests quite far from each other so that their future offspring will have um, enough area to fly around and catch their prey. Random dispersion, there's no pattern. The, just where, where the wind blows, the spores or the seeds, that's where plants would grow. So, example, you have your dandelions. Right? They are this, there's no pattern. They are distributed wherever. They are distributed randomly. Then clumped, okay, such as elephants here. These are usually shown by herd animals. Right? They travel in groups. They travel in clumped um, dispersion. This ensures that the weakest and the oldest are usually protected by the herd okay, or by the, by, by the family of organisms. Other examples here, so yun clumped dispersion shown here by elephants. They tend to herd together. A uniform, such as they, they, there's an equal space between the organism, such as this creosote uh, bush. So they are equally spaced so that the roots will be able to, to get equal number of nutrients and water from the soil then random wherever the wind blows such as your dandelions so spore from spore reproducing or spore forming um, fungi also reproduce uh, are also dispersed in this manner so the last one is age structure so this actually groups the population into three 
based on their reproductive status. So we have the first stage, the, those um, members of the population who fall under pre-reproductive stage. So they are the ones who cannot reproduce yet. So these are the children, the babies, the young ones. The reproductive stage, these are the uh, members of the population that can reproduce already. So that's uh, young adults already. And then post-reproductive stage, these are the groups of people in the population who cannot reproduce anymore. So these are the elderly, um, postmenopausal um, females who cannot reproduce anymore. For more information about age structure, I'll, I recommend that you visit this um, article uh, from Our World in Data. I'll provide the link in the description below. So this is um, another diagram from uh, Our World in Data that shows us the demography of the world population from 1950 to a projected until uh, 2100. Okay? Or 2100. So um, we actually, this is how we, we read um, a diagram like this, okay? So, uh, this the population is usually divided into males and females. So, men or are, are males are found on the left, and then women or females are found on the right, okay? And the pre-reproductive um, years are usually found uh, around here, 15 years old and below. So, this is the pre-reproductive stage of the population. So, they cannot reproduce yet because they are too young. And then the reproductive stage is somewhere between 20 years old to 40 years old. So this is the um, uh, reproductive stage of the population. And then from possibly from 45 to 80 or 90 years old. So this is the post-reproductive um, stage or post-reproductive part of the population. So this is the world population from 1950 to 2100 20, projection. So uh, we, started, we started out with... Um, uh, a very few uh, population, okay? So here, uh, between 0 to 20 million or 0 to 40 million in 1950s for males, and then same then 0 to around 30 or 40 in females. But as you can, as you notice, as time goes by, okay, the population of male and female in the three in the different levels and the different stages of reproductive um, states also increases so from 1950 now it increases in 1960s it's now it's, it's moving in this direction so it's increasing in this direction so from 1990s around 40 million okay then around 50 million for 2018 then there's a projection of 60 million females by 2050 then um more than 60 million by 2075 and then 2100 around 70 million so same in males as time goes by the the, um, the world population of men or males increases over time so we are right around here by right around this region okay so around 50 to 60 million so this is the population of males in the world and it's con it will it's, it is expected to continually increase over time so let's revisit uh, the interaction of biotic potential and environmental resistance and how they affect the population size. So I've mentioned that these two factors, biotic potential and environmental resistance, are important in maintaining balance of um, a population size. So let's review. So again, biotic potential um, is the rate um, by which the population grows, assuming that there's unlimited resources. Um, as long as there's food, water, shelter, everything that they need to survive, the population will continuously increase, okay? So what are examples of those um, growth factors or biotic potential? Um, um, biotic potential, so you have favorable light for favorable temperature, favorable, and anything, everything that's favorable, um, so that, in, that contributes to the population growth. So that's for abiotic factors. For biotic factors, so those are the high reproductive rate. It means that there's very high success in, in, in mating, in breeding, um, adequate food supply, generalized niche. It means that they have a specific role in, in, a, in, an, in their food web, in their food chain. So for example, if they are predators, they're effective predators. If they're producers, they're effective producers. 
Okay, ability to compete, okay, the ability to hide or, or defend against predators, ability to resist diseases and parasites. So they can fight off diseases, so that increases the, the population growth. Ability to migrate and live in other habitats, okay, and ability to adapt to environmental change. All of these growth factors, okay, increase the population. So you can see here from zero to, for example, to 180, I'm not sure, let's just give a number, to, to 5,000, okay? It pushes the, the, the population size towards the positive side, so it increases the population. However, that cannot, um, that cannot remain for long because sooner or later, the population will encounter environmental resistance. So again, these are the factors that decrease the population because there's really no such thing as unlimited resources. Eventually, water will run out, food will run out, mates will run out, um, um, shelter will run out, and that will, that will cause a decrease in population. So environmental resistance, as the name implies, it is the environment resisting the population growth. So what are those in terms of abiotic? So here, if there's favorable, favorable light and temperature. So here, there's too much or too little light, not enough light. Too high or too low temperature, not favorable temperature. Unfavorable chemical environment. So all of this will eventually decrease the population. Okay? So if there's too much plants uh, competing for light or sunlight, eventually some plants will have too little light so they cannot perform photosynthesis then they will die okay so in terms of biotic um re biotic factors so low reproductive rate so not very successful reproduction or mating or breeding uh, unsuitable or destroyed habitat if if their natural environment got destroyed through a fire um, um a hurricane or typhoon or an earthquake okay inability to resist diseases and parasites okay so if they get, if a portion of the population gets sick so that's environmental resistant resistance acting on the population then they eventually die for example if there's too many people there's not enough food not everyone can eat those people will die okay or there's too many uh, there's too many people it's very it's quite easy for diseases to be passed around just like what's happening right now with covid-19 so some people cannot uh, resist the the disease so they eventually die okay um, inability to migrate or live off in ha other habitats okay and um, inability to adapt to environmental change okay so, this limits the population. These are limiting factors that ensures that the population will not grow too big. So, again, ha, biotic potential pushes for population growth. Assuming that there's unlimited resources, but there's no such thing as unlimited resources. Eventually, they will meet environmental resistance and this will push back the population um, back to a balanced number. Now, if you're going to ask me, this is what I often tell my students. There's no good or bad here. Um, growth factors are not good because they, they increase the population. Eventually, um, if there's too many, too many organisms, too many individuals, too many insects, too many lions, too many, um, too many predators, too many uh, plants, eventually it will, it will also lead to the death of some organisms. So biotic potential are not always good and environmental resistance are not always bad. What's good is balance in population. That, that's the aim. That's the goal. To have a balanced population. So we, 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 we should not think that, oh, diseases are bad. I mean, that's why we have levels of organization. If you look at it at organism level, of course, of course, death and disease and diseases and death are, are devastating for, for that person, for that individual. But if you look at it at ecosystem level, that's not surprising. Eventually, it will actually, the population will actually experience environmental resistance because they have too much population. Again, when there's too much population, if it continuously grow, it will meet environmental resistance. So at one, er, at one point, um, plagues, okay, plagues and pandemics and diseases are, are devastating. They take lives they kill if you look at it at organism level but if you look at it at ecosystem level it's actually not not surprising because 
population growth will eventually meet environmental resistance, so such as diseases or, or inability of organisms to, to resist diseases. So again, growth factors, biotic potential, this is not the, not the hero of the ecosystem. And then environmental resistance, this is not the villain of the ecosystem. There's no good or bad here. What we want is balance. This is what we aim for. This is the good this is the good part, okay? This is the good, the good part of the population, a balanced ecosystem, a balanced population size. So, how do we know that um, a population has reached, um, has, has met environmental resistance? So, we have this concept called carrying capacity. So, if you still remember, K, K selected or K, K selection or K reproductive strategy, so the K there is similar to this carrying capacity. K is actually taken from the German word capacitas, capacitas. Uh, and K here um, actually represents carrying capacity or the German word for capacitas grenzi. So, okay, I cannot pronounce it. So carrying capacity is determined by the biotic potential and, and environmental resistance of an ecosystem. So this is we define it as the number of species, number of a species individuals that can be sustained indefinitely in a specific space. So how do we visualize that? Um, uh, so this one, this graph will help us visualize. So this is time, and then this is the population time, a uh, population size. So as time goes by, the population. This is what happens to the population. So. Um, if there's a newly introduced species in a, in an area, for example, a newly introduced species of birds, for example, birds, they will usually they usually start at few numbers, but since there's there's just a few of them in that area, okay, so they mostly have almost unlimited almost unlimited supply of food and water and nutrition and habitat and mates. So that uh, because of that, if you still remember, because of that. Okay, a, a favorable light, temperature, and everything, ability to mate, and all of that, it will cause them to undergo um, exponential growth. Okay, so it means that they will multiply exponentially, not times, not plus one, plus one, plus one, but times two, and times four, and times eight, and times twelve, like that. So the so what drives here is actually biotic potential, everything that is favorable to that group of birds, to that species of birds. In that um, um, area so they will keep on reproducing everything is okay everything is fine biotic potential is acting on them everything is okay all of the needs are met until they reach the carrying capacity of that area for example that the area okay for example 500 square miles for example can only sustain 1,000 um, or 1,000 population or 1,000 um, birds of that species Okay. So once they so once they're around uh, 999 until 1000, then then um, they have already reached the carrying capacity of that ecosystem. So during this time, once they have reached the carrying capacity, what the what the space can what the space can sustain, then they will feel the forces of environmental resistance. So so um, uh, for example, 999 and then 1000 here, okay. So some of them could actually feel, for example, effects of environmental resistance such as uh, too, much, uh, too much light or too little light, unfavorable temperature, inability to resist diseases. So they will feel these factors. Some of them could get sick at this point if there's too much of them. So the temperature, uh, the, the population will drop. Okay, so here, so let's say it's around 900, so oh, there's still um, space, we can still reproduce, so there will, they will feel a rise in, they will have an, a rise in population size. But then again, they will feel the environmental resistance because they have exceeded the population, the carrying capacity, so some of them also will get sick or not everyone will be able to mate or they will, they will have competition for food. Until until they just maintain around they maintain the population size around this level, so there will just be this constant rise and fall, rise and fall of population, but not exceeding the carrying capacity. Okay, so again, a carrying capacity that's the number of pop, the number of individuals a population, an ecosystem can sustain of that particular population. So they usually start very low, 
but because of the actions or of biotic potential, the organisms can undergo exponential growth, so they will continuously reproduce until they meet the, meet the carrying capacity of that ecosystem. When that happens, they will now feel the environmental resistance. One by one, some of them will die, some will not reproduce, some will not survive, okay? but then they could always bounce back until they maintain their population along the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. So this is how biotic potential and environmental resistance affect the population size. So here, so again, this is um, another diagram that shows us, so time and then population. So again, carrying capacity is the amount of organisms that the region can sustain, right? So, um, very low at first and then uh, um, a, biotic, a biotic potential will act and then they will the population will undergo exponential growth until they reach the carrying capacity and then sometimes they could have an overshoot where in the population exceeds the carrying capacity so this is where they will feel the environmental resistance diseases or something or competition that they will die, they, they will eventually die off some will eventually die and then they could bounce back again. They could bounce back and then they will fill again environmental resistance and then until they maintain uh, their population along the carrying capacity of that um, ecosystem. So this is um, considered exponential J-shaped curve. So letter J. Okay? So that's usually uh, during exponential growth. So you see letter J here. It means that there's almost unlimited resources and then biotic potential um, is a major driving force in the population increase. Now, once, once um, the population has, so after all of this um, adjustment um, um, while maintaining the carrying capacity, eventually, eventually the population will reach a, a stable equilibrium. Okay? So, in, uh, uh, exponential growth, exponential growth, then they reach the carrying capacity, and then they feel the effects of environmental resistance until they have more or less a stable equilibrium in terms of population number. So this, is hap this happens when the population aligns with the carrying capacity of that ecosystem. So we call this the logistic S-shaped curve. Okay, so because there's this, this is the letter J first, uh, this is the letter J. But once this becomes stable, uh, once this becomes stable, it will now have uh, this letter S shape, logistic growth or logistic shape um, of population. So this is um, this is what's the, what's ideal, okay? So this is for this formed when the growth rate decreases as the carrying capacity is approached by the population. So eventually, this will lead to um, uh, stable equilibrium. So to understand better about um, exponential and logistic growth in population, I recommend that you watch this video from Khan Academy. I'll provide the link in the description below. Okay, so more comparison again, exponential versus logistic growth. If there is unlimited, unrestricted, unlimited resources, so that's a J-shaped here, right? growth rate, uh, the population uh, um, accelerates. However, once they have met the carrying capacity, it will have a more S-shaped curve, okay? The, the rate slows down, okay? And then more or less, the population will just be around the carrying capacity of the environment. So this is um, a good way for us to, to visualize you know, with, the, with examples. So for, um, so, uh, for example, so this is over time and the number of individuals. So large mammals, okay, such as this seal or sea lion, they usually show logistic growth. Okay? So when they're new to that area, so they will they will experience this, um, they will experience this rate of acceleration or, or acceleration in population size. However, since they're quite big and they cannot afford to, to have too much of them in that area, more or less they will maintain their population okay, along the carrying capacity of that area. Okay? However, there are small mammals such as this rabbit, okay, wherein they really do not care much, okay, of the carrying capacity. It does not exist for them. As long as there's food, they will they will breed, okay. That's why they're, 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 it's possible for them to actually eat themselves to death, okay. That 
uh, it means that they, they do not care if there's nothing left. If, if there's food, they will continuously eat. If, if they are fed, they will continuously breed until there's nothing left for them to eat anymore. So they are good examples of exponential growth uh, in an ecosystem. So again, no, more about exponential and logistic growth. I recommend this, this lesson from Khan Academy. I'll provide the link in the description below. So aside from those um, terms, okay, I also want to introduce to you density and limiting factors. So we've talked about population density. So that's the number of um, individuals um, in a given area. Okay? So there, there are two types of um, density and limiting factors. So you have your density independent factors. Okay? So they are not they do not depend on the density. This population control affects the population regardless if there's many people or very few people. Examples of those are abiotic factors in a community. It means that water supply regardless of how many people will always be a constant or a density popula independent population control such as climate or, or weather or, or soil pH. Abiotic factors are not affected. Uh, as population control are not affected by the density of the population. While we also have density dependent factors or population control, wherein they are more active if there's high, uh, if the density increases, for example, diseases. So they, they are more active, they can actually control the population better if there's high density. It means that they can, they can reduce the population better as the density increases. I know it's quite... I know it's quite, you know, heartless, but, you know, that's that's how nature works. I do not understand. Uh, maybe it's because of cartoons. But nature is not really, you know, people singing and then um, Disney princesses singing and then, and then the animals will approach her and then they will be very calm and then listen. Nature... Nature is is um, savage. Nature is all about survival. Nature is either you, you eat or you, you get eaten. Either you survive or you do not survive. So nature is ruthless. Okay, it's not it's not um, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. It's actually a very savage world. So more um, terms. So these are examples of natural population curves. So since we've tackled about j-shaped exponential growth and s-shaped logistic growth these are other population curves okay so we, uh, so again time and the number of individuals so the first one is a stable population curve so mostly we could assume that this population has already reached the carrying capacity so more or less there's really no no big rise or fall in the population uh, number letter b eruptive so this usually follows a stable population and then something spikes up the population something happens that causes this drastic increase in um, population so for example this could be a population of algae in in a pond and then there's a rise in nutrients because someone dumped uh, their waste okay or their chemical waste in the pond that that are actually rich in nutrients that will cause the rise in the in the in the in the reproduction and in the in the population of algae uh, so so eventually they will die off so if you're familiar with red tide actually this is a good example or green or green tide or algal bloom this is a good example so this is the normal number of red algae but then due to pollution there's a spike in their population okay so eventually they die off cyclic Letter C, cyclic, this is a population curve that follows a cycle or season. So, for example, during summer, we have this number of, uh, for example, many, many um, fruit-bearing trees during uh, summer, spring and summer. But when it comes to during fall or winter, there's, there's few of them or some of them die off. Uh, then eventually, they will become active again next, next some spring or summer or those organisms who hibernate. Okay, so they're very active during during hot seasons, but then they're inactive or few in numbers during cold seasons. Then letter D irregular, as you can see, obviously they have no definite pattern. Okay? So there's no pattern in their population growth. So there, there's this decrease and then wrap up um, eruption and then decrease again. So these are examples of population curves. Now, how do we visualize population curves? Um, 
and and what are the what is a good example for that um, in terms of controlling population size so here this one is actually a, a study of um, relationship between hair so that's this hair it's um, uh, related to rabbits okay and length uh, a wild cat okay so this one uh, is a study over for over all these years from 1845 to 1935 so we will actually see that as time goes by the role of predation is actually important in controlling the population size of both the predator and the prey so um, let's see here that um, it started out with a 20 around so this is over time and then this is population size in thousands so um, so color blue is hair population so it's around 20,000 hair and around 30,000 lynxes okay or lynx cats lynx so so predator prey so because there's this number of prey okay and they have uh, the 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 predator the lynx are eating them uh, we can see that after several years there's an increase in in the population of the lynx okay and a decrease so since they are the ones being eaten a decrease in the population of the hares okay so as you can see as the population of the prey decreases sooner or later the number of predators also decreases because there's nothing left to eat all the preys are gone so of course they cannot survive not all can survive eventually people uh, um, the lynx will die off so once the lynx decrease in number around 10 in let's say 1850s okay that caused an increase in the population of the hares because nobody's eating them anymore so a decrease in population of the predator causes an increase in the population of the prey okay so until they just have this um, continuous increase however sometime in 1855 the since there's many hares now the lynx cats are now eating well the lynxes are now eating well and because of that you will see here a dip okay a dip in the population of the hares okay because more and more more and more uh, lynxes are eating them so when, once there's a dip in the population you also ex you can also see that there's also a decrease in the population of the predator so so there since there's a decrease in the population there's now another increase in population of the prey then decrease in the population in the predator then eventually will cause another rise in the uh, population of the prey so eventually after 20 years um, the population of the hares and the lynx under uh, can be seen as a cyclical um, uh, population curve that as the prey increases the predators also increases so since they are eating more and more there will be a drop in the population of the hares so that the population of the predator will also drop so if if the predator the population of the predator drops then the hairs will now increase the prey will increase then it will follow year um in the following months then eventually they will they will mirror the um the population size of each other so this is how predation controls the population size of the prey Okay. so the number of predator actually dictates the number of preys that will survive so in this predator prey cycle is this a top down or a bottom up control uh, if you still remember that principle of ecosystem is this a top down or bottom up control okay. it's actually a top down control because it's the predator the number of predator that dictates the number of um, preys and you can actually see if you if you study the population of whatever plant the hares are eating for example um, carrots or grass if you just add up if you add up that graph here you will also see the same pattern that as the the number of hares increases the carrots uh, decreases because that's what they're eating so you have here another graph that mirrors their cyclical population curve So this is not new to you, no. This has been partially mentioned uh, uh, during the, the the beginning of the video that reproductive patterns um, can be classified into two: R selected and K selected species. Okay. So again, R selected R here refers to the rate of um, population growth. 
So they have more more organ more offspring that can survive. Okay? Um so most of spe most species of this type go to irregular and unstable cycles just like this one, okay? Um uh, cycles in their population size. Well, K selection, so K here refers to the carrying capacity. Um, so, they generally follow a logistic growth. Okay? So, once they meet the population size, or the, the carrying capacity, they more or less maintain their population size. So, many of larger species, they have long generation time and low reproductive rate. Okay? So, they have very few offspring, but they take care of their offspring. The only downside is they are prone to extinction because they're just few in numbers. Okay, so you can actually check this out. So this is what I was saying that um, um, are there refers to the maximum growth of the population referring to biotic um, potential while the K there, R comes from rate while K comes from the German word for carrying capacity which is capacitas or Capacitas gensi, the capacity limit. So again, no, these are your R selected species. They have many small offspring, little to no parental care or 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 protection of the offspring. They had just have small adults or small bodies. Many offspring die before they reach reproductive stage. Um, they have low ability to compete and their population size fluctuates. While well, case, for so example, your cockroach and dandelion. Well, case, case selected species, these are usually fewer, but they have larger offspring and then larger adults also. Most offspring survive to reproductive stage age because they have high parental care. The parents take care of their offspring until they are mature. Okay? So the population size are fairly stable. They have high ability to compete. However, they're prone to extinction. So you have your elephant and sarawaho cactus. So another concept here is survivorship curve. For population of different species vary on how long each of their members typically live. So they could have late low. So the survivorship curve shows that us. Okay, so that shows that to us. So you have your late loss, early loss, and constant loss. How do we see that? So mostly for those organisms that undergo our selection, such as your fish and amphibians, they have early loss. It means that. Many of them die at an early age, okay? While K-selected species such as the rhinoceros and some large mammals and some large reptiles, they have late loss. It means that many survive during childhood, okay, 100% because their parents take care of them. And very um, eventually, they have very long lifespan and they die. Um, they have longer lifespan. While we have... Organisms such as this bird that have constant loss, loss all throughout their lives. It means that many of them are killed when they're young or die when they're young, when they're in their mid um, 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 middle adulthood, and then very few will survive into adulthood. So they have constant loss all throughout their lives. So usually these are the preys, okay, because they are eaten when they're young, they're eaten when they're um, middle age, and then they're eaten when they're old. So a life table shows the numbers of individuals at, at each stage of each age of survival uh, curve okay so um to learn more about why why animals have different lifespans i recommend that you watch this ted ed video this is actually not a recommendation but a requirement and this will actually open your mind and open your your um, answer your, your curiosity as to why we have varying uh, lifespans among organisms so i'll provide the link in the description below um why i recommend it is that it will shock you that humans really do not have such a long lifespan when compared to other animals and organisms okay but again we have um special circumstance okay but so that's why you you are required to watch this video now um life expectancy is actually covered by the um, concept of age structure we've talked about this in uh, population dynamics um, so i recommend that you visit this article from our world data our world in data i'll provide the link in the description below okay so this is one of the many concept misconceptions i want to correct okay so life expectancy for humans is nothing but increasing over time i want to correct this concept that we have 
because you know it saddens me what when i read at at your age na some some of you will still think that we have longer lifespans in the past or people live longer in the past and then at the present we have shorter lifespans it's 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 a misconception misconception it's not true it's incorrect we have to correct that um so this diagram this, this um graph shows us the life expectancy of the world population from 1800s to 2002 and as you can see the the, the life expectancy is only growing or only increasing so in 1800s the global um, average life expectancy of humans was only around 32 years old so in 1800s if you reach 32 years old you're 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 expected to die anytime okay why uh, well because because of war because of poor sanitation they did not have soap possibly so back then very poor medi medicine practice no antibiotics yet they have not yet separated the sewage water from drinking water poor sanitation in their cities um so these are um causes for them to have very short lifespan but as technology increases uh, uh, improves technology improves more and more access to medicine um the the, pop, uh, the life expectancy um also increases from so in 1950s from 32 the ex life expectancy is around 48 and then now around 2000 2010 2012 the the human life expectancy is 70 years so imagine from 1800s to 2010 2012 from 32 the life expectancy of humans have already doubled from 32 to 70 years old so the idea that we have longer lifespan in the past is a misconception we have longer lifespans now so these are more infographics from our world in data still talking about human life expectancy uh, from 1800s to 2015 so around 1800s although these are mostly historical estimates but they say uh, based on studies they say that um, around 1800s the um, average of uh, human population was around the global average was around 29 years old okay so uh, that's the global average of life expectancy of humans so um it generous this is a generous ex um, estimation that uh, it's less than 40 years old so around this time that's the lifespan of humans but around 1950s as you can see there's this change in life expectancy so for countries such as the philippines so there's an increase in 55 years old 69 in australia third line of three 30s 38 33 in africa 39 28 35 35 in india 43 in china 55 in russia um, quite um, longer li life expectancy higher life expectancy in um, canada and u.s um, and all of this okay so there's this increase from our, from less than 40 to an increase in life expectancy in major parts of the globe then present so as you can see here most of the life ex expectancy are now between 60 to 70 years so most of most major parts of the globe then we also have 80 years old to 85 for australia um europe and then canada okay the philippines we still are um our expected life expectancy is still around uh, 69 so what makes um lifespan longer in this region so okay that's that's one good um research to do okay, that's one thing you, you could actually research about but actually in this article uh, from our world in our world in data it, it explains why there's this discrepancy in the life expectancy um, um, of humans in different regions okay so that includes um, um, diet um, uh, medicine government um, population size um, education and all of that which will be the topic of our next video okay the different factors that affect human population size okay so kindly wait for that one so that ends our video for tonight i hope you learned something new today don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video till next time goodbye